was going through my bookshelves where I keep the books that I've read and I was kind of looking at all of the covers and I started noticing some similarities in covers, specifically covers of books that I liked. It sparked something in my brain. It made me start to think about how I view book covers and what book covers I'm drawn to. So this video is going to be an experiment, I guess, of me reading books that have covers that look like my favorite books, if that makes sense. Before we get into the books that I will be reading for this video, I did want to just kind of like take you through my thought process going through this. So I think I've mentioned this many times, but I am a marketing major. so. I I'm always very curious about how books are marketed and covers are obviously the number one marketing tools that a publisher has in getting books to a wide audience of people. We can all say that we don't judge books by a cover, but we're human and we do. Covers are the very first thing you see when you look at a book and there are definitely specific cover designs that will draw in specific types of people. And I've seen it many, many times where you can distinctly tell that there is some marketing strategy going on when deciding a book cover. One of the biggest, I think, recently has been the Romance Illustrated covers because if you look back like three, four years ago, that wasn't really a thing. There weren't really romance books with these like cutesy illustrated covers. And now it's like every traditionally published romance book has an illustrated cover because publishers realized that those covers Covers are reaching a wider demographic of people, reaching people who might not normally have picked up romance books because of their covers. I've also seen it in the past where publishers will redesign covers to reach a different audience. One in particular was the Winner's Curse trilogy by Marie Rutkowski. When these books came out, it was a very big trend in YA to have covers with girls in beautiful gowns. And then while the series was coming out, Another very popular series came out which was Throne of Glass and those obviously had badass looking girl with weapons and so a lot of books including the winners trilogy made either recover designs or came out with covers of a girl <laughs> carrying weapons in like armor and stuff. And that was to market those books to the Throne of Glass audience. I've seen it again recently with the releases of The Beautiful and Crave, which are very clearly being marketed towards the Twilight audience with their cover designs. You look at both of these covers and you immediately think of Twilight. So covers play a really big role, not just in an aesthetic purpose, but in who is going to be the demographic that picks up this book, who is going to be the target audience. So when I look at my own books that I have read and enjoyed, there's a couple that stand out to me to being obviously similar. So the first two would be Forest of a Thousand Lanterns by Julie C. Dow and Girl Serpent Thorn by Melissa Barshados. I love both these books. I gave both of them five stars. Both of these covers are of snakes wrapped up in flowers. Very clear metaphor. Both of these books are kind of similar, but they're both about a girl who has had a rough life and is being seduced by some sort of evil or darkness. Hence, the flowers with a snake. So when Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia came out, I was always drawn to this cover, but I never really knew why. It reminded me of something. And then I realized, the Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. There are some differences, but they are very similar. Um, and again, these two books do have similarities. They're both historical books that take place in the 1950s following a woman who is a little bit different and wants different things than what is expected of women at this time. And again, I loved both of these books. So I really wanted to use that as an experiment to hopefully find books that I will also love. Because in my mind, if two books have similar covers, that means that the publishers or the marketing teams or whoever was behind those books believe that those covers are gonna attract the same audience. So it goes with reason to think that if you liked one book, you would like the other book as well, right? You, you guys following? Me. I hope this makes sense and it's not like a scramble in my brain because when I was planning out this video I literally felt like that clip from It's Always Sunny where he's like <laughs> he has all the strings and the pictures on the wall. So this took me forever to find books because it, it's not really a simple thing as like going to Google and being like 
what are covers that look like my favorite covers. I had to like really, really research and dig for these books, but I found some. Some that are exactly the same, like if you looked at either one of these books, you would think of the other one. Some that clearly have similar influences or similar art style designs. So the first book that is my favorite is The Library of the Unwritten by AJ Hackwood. I read this earlier in the year and I gave it five stars. I really, really loved it. It's a very strange fantasy book. And the book that I found that is like looking at them side by side, they're exactly the same cover. That is The Library at Mount Char by Scott Hawkins. So yes, they're both the library of, but look at this. They're the same cover. <laughs> so they're both like a ripped up center of a book with something in the middle like coming out. So this book follows a group of children who were taken by this man who claims that he is a god and he basically trains them in this library. Each of them have a different like discipline or area of study. Now they're all grown up and their father has gone missing so they try to find him. It's supposed to be very dark, very bizarre, kind of like this, dark and bizarre. So the next book that is my favorite is a Curious Beginning by Diana Rayborn. This is the first book in the Veronica Speedwell series, which is a book series that I love. I've read the first four books and it's just such a fun Victorian mystery series with a slow burn romance. And so the book that I found that looks very similar is The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter by Theodora Goss. They both have very similar text styles with kind of floral vine designs going throughout. Even both of the titles are kind of in the same positions. Like, they're very similar covers. And this is also a Victorian mystery. It is following a group of girls who are all the daughters of classic gothic characters. So the main main character is the daughter of Dr. Jekyll. There's also a woman who was the bride of Frankenstein. They get brought together to solve a mystery. I believe Sherlock Holmes also appears in this book. So yeah, I'm very, very excited for this one. I think this is the one I might be the most excited for because I've really been looking for another series that reminds me of this because this series is just so much fun. So hopefully this can fulfill that fun Victorian mystery vibes that I've been looking for. So then the last book that I chose that was my favorite is Wilder Girls by Rory Power. This is a YA horror. So the book that I found that has a cover similar to this is Horrid by Katrina Leno. Both of these have very similar art design styles as well as they both play with the illusion of flowers coming out of a girl's body. As soon as I saw the Katrina Leno cover, I knew immediately that it reminded me of the Wilder Girls cover. So Horrid is about a girl who moves with her mother to her child childhood New England home after her father dies and while she is there she learns all these secrets. There's possibly a strange little girl living in their house or is it a ghost? Is it nothing? Is it in her head? So I'm very very excited to read this one. So those are the three books that I will be reading for this video and hopefully this experiment will go well and this can be like a foolproof way for me in the future to find new books that I'm gonna love. Um, well, <laughs> first, just ignore any of the mess or the clothes that you see in the background. I'm in the middle of doing like 20 loads of laundry, so be a good person and pretend you don't see it. But also, I meant to do a check-in after I started Horrid. By the way, I started Horrid. And then I ended up reading the entire book in one sitting. Oh, I don't know about this lighting. I have a migraine right now, so like any light on hurts my brain. Um, so I just have my little bat light on. Let me, ooh, if I put it here, it's kind of, it's kind of spooky. This might actually be good vibes for the book. What if I talked about the book like this? Do we like that? <laughs> no, I'm gonna put it back over there. Um, so, horrid. Yeah, I read it in one sitting. It was a very quick 
fast paced read. I don't have a copy of it because it hasn't come out yet. I think by the time this video goes up though, it will be out because I don't think I'm gonna put this video up until October. This was my first Katrina Leno book and I've heard about Katrina Leno a lot, but I've never like really paid attention to her books because from my understanding, they're YA contemporary. I just don't pay attention to YA contemporary, but I know that she's an author that people really, really love, but I was excited for this book because it is a YA horror and I really like YA horror and I really enjoyed this. I ended up giving it four stars. I guess let's talk about what it's about. So uh, it follows this girl and her mother and right at the start of the book, her father passes away. They go bankrupt or they don't have any money left and so they end up having to move back to her mother's childhood home which is a place that she's always avoided she's never wanted to take her daughter to there she's always kind of had like secrecy around her childhood home which honestly the premise of this reminded me a lot of burn our bodies down by rory power the rest of the book not so much but like the basis premise of like a mother hiding her past and her home like her her childhood home life from her daughter very similar so they end up having to move back to her childhood home which is this like haunted manor in a small town in maine which i'm actually familiar with the town in maine that this is set i have a couple friends who live there i've been there before and i recognized some of the locations and stuff which was cool and it had a very distinct like fall new england vibe so they move back there and she finds out that the house that she's living in is called Creep Manor by everyone in town because it's very like creepy but no one will really talk about why and while she's living there there's a lot of very creepy things that happen there's a storage room that is locked but occasionally she'll see like a light on underneath the door and like footsteps moving like clearly someone's walking next to the door or she'll hear like a marble rolling on the other side of the door or a couple times she was outside and she saw somebody in the window but every time she brings it up with her mother her mom like discounts it says it's nothing whatever and also the main character is uh dealing with a lot of anger issues which is something i don't know that i've ever actually read about i don't think i've read about a character who has anger problems and has gone through anger management which was very interesting for me i don't know if i've ever talked about this but i had a really bad anger problem when i was a kid and one of the things that i did in therapy like through my teenage years was anger management and it's really funny whenever i tell people that now like people who didn't know me when i was a kid that i had anger problems because their response is always like I can't even picture you being angry because I'm such a zen chill person but yeah it was really interesting reading about a character who was dealing with anger problems and the way that she was dealing with them was definitely in an unhealthy way so she has something I'd never heard of this before but I, I think it's called pika or pika and it's a uh psychological disorder where you eat non-edible substances um, and so for her the way that she did it was whenever she would feel those angry feelings she would eat pages of a book so she would pick a book and just like rip off little pieces at a time and eat them and then when the book was completely empty she would refill the book with blank pages and turn it into a journal where she would like write all her feelings and stuff so that was the way that she dealt with her anger issues which was very interesting to read and she's a little bit of an unreliable narrator which i've definitely talked about i have a, some issues with books where the main character has some sort of mental illness that causes them to be an unreliable narrator i oftentimes don't love it because it's done in a very glamorizing or problematic way. I didn't feel that way about this book. I felt that it was done in a very sensitive way. And so the ending, okay. I think the ending is where people are going to be divided. I loved the ending. If you're familiar with me, you know that I like open endings. I like unsatisfying endings. I like endings that don't really answer questions or make sense. There was a point where I was a little bit worried that it was going to take 
a different direction. I thought, ugh, oh, this is gonna like turn into an after school special and it's like everything's gonna be okay. I won't say what happened, but I'm so glad the direction that it took because it did not shy away from having a brutal ending. And I guess that's always one of my like one of the things I look for when I read YA horror is that I think there's a the conception that YA horror is going to steer more into like being tame and kind of holding back the horror elements and I don't think this did. There was definitely a couple moments that I was like, that's dark. So I did end up giving this four stars. The reason it's not five stars is because I felt like there could have been a little bit more. I really liked the ending and I liked the beginning but there was a little bit in the middle that kind of dragged um, and I felt like some scenes were just being repeated a bunch of times but overall I really enjoyed it and I thought it was a very solid YA horror and I'm excited to read more of Katrina Leno. To answer the question, do I think that the covers of Horrid and Wilder Girls being similar, do I think that these books are for the same audiences? Do I think that these books are similar? Definitely. The entire time I was reading Horrid, I was thinking that fans of Rory Power would really enjoy it. They have a very similar writing style, which is very distinct. I've always said that Rory Power's writing style is very unique, and I don't even really know fully how to describe it because I haven't read many other authors who write like that, but Katrina Leno definitely falls in that unique, weird writing style. And definitely if you like Rory Power's endings, you're gonna like the ending of Horrid. Obviously in terms of plots, they're very different. Wilder Girls is more of a sci-fi horror about a virus and mutations, whereas Horrid is like a haunted house ghost horror. Um, so plot-wise they're very different, but in terms of writing and style, they're very similar. So this was definitely a very successful pairing and like I said I'm so excited to read more of Katrina Leno. So I do want to take a brief intermission to talk about the sponsor for today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people. They offer membership with meaning, with so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives. Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. It is curated specifically for learning, meaning Meaning that there are no ads and they're always launching new premium classes so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. And it is less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. So very fittingly for this video I found a bunch of classes on Skillshare about book cover design. One in particular that is about illustrated lettering. So there's a class on here taught by Jessica Hish who is a lettering artist, illustrator, and author and she redesigned the covers of a bunch of classic books in a typography. So every lesson breaks down her step-by-step -step approach to lettering while also sharing illustration and composition techniques. I thought this was a really relevant class to this video and the first 1,000 people to click the link in my description will get a free trial to the premium membership of Skillshare. started The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter, which is the similar cover to The A Curious Beginning by Diana Rayborn. So I read the first like couple of chapters so I can give a much better synopsis. Basically this is a Victorian mystery following a group of girls, like I said. The main character is Mary Jekyll, who is the daughter of Dr. Jekyll. At the start of the book, her mother has passed away and she finds out that they were going bankrupt so they don't have any money left. And while she is going to their lawyer, she finds out that her mother had been making monthly payments to this boarding house under the name of Hyde, who she knows to be her father's friend, who when she was a child committed a murder and disappeared. And shortly after that, her father killed himself. So she doesn't know what we know or anyone who's familiar with the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. She doesn't know. And so she goes to find the very famous 
investigator Sherlock Holmes to have him help her on this case to find out why her mother was sending all of this money to somebody named Hyde. And that kind of leads her on this long investigation where she crosses paths with many different women and she discovers this society of scientists who were experimenting on their daughters. So that's the basic plot. Um, but what's really, really cool is the style in which this book is written. So basically the actual book, the actual story that's being told is a book that is written by one of the characters. And so throughout the book, there is commentary from all the other characters that's like interjected, almost like they're editors of the book and they're like making little notes. So they're like periodically a character will be like, that's not really what I was thinking or that's not really what I said. And they'll have like little conversations about the actual book, which is really cool and kind of gives it this extra layer of realism, I guess. So, so far I'm really enjoying this. I feel like within the first 50 pages of a book, I can kind of tell if I'm gonna to love it or not and I'm definitely feeling like I'm loving this and it actually is reminding me of a movie that I just watched called Enola Holmes which is like the new Sherlock movie that came out on Netflix with Millie Bobby Brown following Sherlock's little sister. This really really reminds me of that especially with all the commentary because in the movie of Enola Holmes she breaks the fourth wall and talks to the audience and I feel kind of like the commentary is like that and a lot of the commentary is very humorous in nature so it adds a really cool element I think and I just really love Victorian mysteries or honestly any like Victorian or Gregorian set movies or books for me comfort movies are like Sherlock Holmes anything Jane Austen I just really like the 1800s England time period so I'm really enjoying this so far and I'm also listening to it on audio and following along and I really like the narrator. She does different voices and accents for all the characters so it's really easy to like know who's speaking because they all have very distinct voices. Am I about to rewatch Enola Holmes for the fourth time? Yes. Yes I am. Now where to begin? I need to order coffee right now. I don't know why, but for some reason I could not sleep at all last night. I don't know if I was just like, if I had a lot of anxiety or I was extra paranoid, but like every single sound that I heard, I was like, not, not scared or freaking out. I was just like, I couldn't stop noticing sounds. And so it kept me awake. It wasn't even like, people were making noise. It was just like little tiny sounds. I don't know how to explain it, but I just could not sleep. And then eventually the sun came up, so I was like, I guess I'll just get up. And now here we are. Um, but I need coffee and I don't have any. And I would go drive to get some, but I'm like so tired. I don't know if I should be driving. <laughs> oh my God, I've been staring at my phone. I didn't even remember what I was doing. Coffee. Okay, hopefully that comes quick. Um, but I did finish The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter last night. Maybe that was why I was so like wired up last night because I gave this five stars. This was just like oh, so good and I'm so annoyed with myself because I've owned this for a really, really long time. I don't even remember when I bought it. I don't remember if I've ever even showed it in a book haul. I really don't think I've ever talked about this on my channel, ever put it on a TBR, ever mentioned it or showed it. As far as I know, it just kind of appeared in my life four or five years ago. And I've always held on to it for some reason, like through every unhaul, every call of my books. I've always kept it. And I'm so glad that I did because it's definitely gonna be a favorite for the year. Like the characters, the plot, the writing, everything was just so perfect. So I'll talk a little bit about the characters because they were so good. 
So basically it was this group of five, occasionally six girls who all had very difficult relationships with their fathers. Like I said before, basically they stumbled upon this conspiracy about this society of scientists who have been experimenting on their daughters. And so a couple of the girls in this group are those girls who were experimented on. One of them, Catherine Moreau, is the daughter of Dr. Moreau and she is very cat-like. Then we have Justine Frankenstein who was created to be the bride of Frankenstein. Um, there's Beatrice Rappuccini who is very poisonous. Then there's Diana Hyde who has a very interesting personality. And then we have Mary Jekyll. And so basically there's a bunch of murders that are being committed of young women and their body parts are going missing so every dead body has one body part that is severed and gone and so they work together with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson to solve this mystery and figure out what's going on and trying to catch the society that their fathers were a part of and it was just so good. I loved these characters so much because they all were so vivid and full of life and like I could really really picture them. I feel like a lot of times when I read books the author doesn't do a good enough job at describing the characters that I can't really picture them. And I'm not specifically talking about physical descriptions or like I can't picture how they look. I mean, I, I can't picture how they act, how they are, how they move about a space, you know? I felt like I could really, really picture how all of these characters behaved and they all had such distinct voices. And the commentary aspect was just so amazing. I almost wish more books did this because it was so fun and like the characters and the plot and the setting and all of that was amazing and would have already been five stars but then the way that the story was written with the commentary just like added a little cherry on top and made it so great and obviously there were a lot of like dark moments because there's dark stuff happening but I feel like it was very humorous as well, and the humor really balanced out the darker moments. I also really, really enjoyed how all the women have very conflicting backgrounds and beliefs, and they really balanced each other out well and challenged each other, not only just like with their bold personalities, but with political views, with religious views, they all had kind of conflicting beliefs and I feel like even though they're all so different they came together in such a perfect way and so there was a lot of really great discussions throughout about religion and politics because of their conflicting views and oh I think that's my coffee oh okay I'm very happy this is what I needed I got a salted caramel mocha if anyone is curious. So, do I think these covers being similar reflects the books? Do I think it was accurately targeting the same audiences? Yes, because the entire time I was reading this, it really reminded me of the Veronica Speedwell series. I'm debating saying I liked this even better because you guys know how much I love this series. I've read the first four books, so I've been with this series longer, but this was just so amazing. Oh, I'm really struggling. I think I, I think I would have to read more of the series to accurately decide which I like better. But definitely, if you're a fan of either or, you should try the other one because um, they definitely have a lot of similarities. This one leans more into like a slow burn romance because the relationship dynamic in this book is between two characters who do have feelings for each other. Whereas this one, the main character dynamics is between a group of women who are friends and like kind of a found family. So the, the center relationships are different, but in terms of like the plot and the overall vibe and setting, they definitely match. I will say though, there is no romance in this book. So I don't want to get anybody's hopes up who's like looking for a romance. But did that stop me from shipping somebody? No. I don't know if it's even a thing or if it's gonna be a thing or if I was reading too much into it but I definitely was shipping the main character with Sherlock Holmes. I could have been reading into it. There was definitely certain parts where they would have like lingering looks and I'm like hold up. 
<laughs> Especially because I just rewatched Enola Holmes um, yesterday, and so I have in my head that Sherlock is Henry Cavill. <laughs> So I don't know if that is going to become something, if it's going to be a slow burn type of thing, or if, if I'm just like making it up, but it was nice. So yeah, if we are going off of the covers, do I think that this was a successful read? Absolutely. And I am so, so excited to read the rest of this series. I believe that it's a trilogy and all the books are already out, so I might order them because <laughs> I kind of just want to read the rest of the series which honestly does not happen often where I want to binge book series but that's exactly what happened with the Veronica Speedwell series I binged it which like I do not do often so I'm just so excited <laughs> started the library at Mount Char. I read the first chapter. It was very bizarre. Like I don't even know how else to explain what I just read. Basically, this is following a group of people who were taken as children by this man who calls himself their father and he claims he's a god and he basically holds them in this place called the library and forces them to train and learn in different disciplines. So like the main character, her discipline is language. So she learned every language that there is. Another one, his discipline is war and murder. Another one is a healer, one who can go to like the dead realms and speak to the dead. And he basically forbids them from learning anything about anyone else's disciplines because he doesn't want any one person to get too much power and like be more power powerful than him. And so the conflict at the start of the book is that they have been locked out of the library and their father has gone missing. So they're trying to find him. And yeah, it's really bizarre, but like in a good way, it's the kind of weird bizarre that I really like. Okay, so I've read a bit more. I'm about 100 pages into it and I really like that the way that this is being told, basically I feel like Every chapter is a puzzle piece, but we don't know what image the puzzle makes. We don't know how all of the pieces connect. But there's a lot of missing information or confusing information or misleading information because basically the main character that we're following, Carolyn, she hates her father and hates one of her brothers, David. And I think that this whole thing is being plotted by her, but we don't actually know that yet. I'm just kind of guessing because basically she is keeping a lot of secrets. She's really hiding her intentions because her father and David, the people that she is working against or has hateful feelings towards, can see into her mind and read her thoughts and her emotions. So she really hides her intentions from everybody, including the audience. And at one point she says that she has to plot in her dreams because her dreams are the only place where she is completely free and has privacy. And so that's really interesting because a lot of it, you're being presented one thing, but you kind of have to like read into the hidden layer underneath of like, what her real intentions are or what she's really doing because what's being presented isn't completely accurate, if that makes sense. So many bizarre things are happening. We're kind of flipping back and forth between present and then different flashbacks in the past. And like every chapter is so bizarre. And like I said, they feel like puzzle pieces where you don't know how they're connecting yet. Like there's this one chapter where they're, they go and they rescue a lion and they're like talking to a lion. There's another chapter where Carolyn uh, convinces this guy to break into a police's house with her and murder him. Do we know why? No. Do we know why they were talking to this lion? No. Like it's just so bizarre. And all the characters are crazy and weird. Like not only do they act weird, but they all dress weird. Her brother David, who is the war discipline, he is very, very, very violent and scary, but he wears a tutu. Like none of them are normal. <laughs> One of their sisters walks around with three dead ghost children. Why? I don't know. <laughs> like so much of this book is just like, I don't know, but I'm enjoying it. So I just got to 
part two and I've been sitting here trying to figure out what this reminds me of because it really reminded me of something and then it clicked. It rem <laughs> This is gonna sound so weird but it reminds me of The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune except the exact opposite. So like where that book is about a bunch of misfit children being taken in by this really kind mysterious man and it's like pure whimsy and fun. This book is that but a very dark, violent, bizarre, twisted, wrong version of that, if that makes sense. I feel like these characters are almost like the characters from the House in the Cerulean Sea but in like a dark alternate reality. So bizarre. I just finished this. I don't really even know what to say about it or how to talk about it because it's just so weird. And I don't like, I really, okay. Okay, let's just start with my rating. I think I'm giving it four stars, but with an asterisk that I might change it to five stars later after I think about it for a while because it was just, it's just so weird. I don't know. I don't know that I fully 1000% understood it and I think that's fine, but I really enjoyed it. What I liked the most was the main character, Carolyn. She was very interesting. I just really enjoyed this. I'm actually kind of surprised how much I enjoyed it. So to answer the question that I've been experimenting this entire video, do I think that these covers matching reflected the insides of the books? This one I'm a little bit torn on. I do think that they could have crossover appeal. I think if you liked this one, you could also like this one. They definitely had similar vibes in like being very outlandish and bizarre, but that's kind of where the similarities ended. Which is strange because of all of the covers, these are the two that look the most alike. And I definitely think these are the ones that are the most different. But I do think that they would appeal to the same types of people. Obviously, I, lo I loved both of these, so I think that the same types of audiences would like both of these books. So pretty much, if I'm looking at all of these books, I think that this experiment was successful. I definitely feel like I found that books with similar looking covers are similar and would be liked by the same types of people. Of all the new books that I read, these two and Horrid, I loved all of them. Um, obviously, this was my favorite <laughs> of the three that I read, but like I said, I could move this up to five stars if I give it a little bit more thought and time. Going off of what I set out to do, which was to pick books that I already loved, find covers that look like these, and hope that those are also books that I will enjoy, that was successful. I managed to do that, which is great because now I feel like I have a very solid way to find new books that I'm gonna love with clear evidence that it works. So I would love to do this video again in the future. I don't know if I will be able to because it is a very hard video to find books for because finding covers that are similar is not the easiest task. If you guys know of any, if you can think of any books that you already know that I love and you know of a cover that looks like those, please let me know. <laughs> and I hope you guys liked this video. I hope that after watching this maybe you can look at your books and try to find some new ones based on the covers that you're gonna love. It was a really fun experiment. So thank you guys for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye!